Hello, and welcome to Special Ed on Special Ed, where special ed experts discuss special ed topics for special ed parents. I'm your host, Dana Johnson, and I've experienced special ed from many angles. I'm a special ed attorney in private practice, a former special ed teacher and administrator, a current mom to four children who've all experienced special ed, and I myself have ADHD and dyslexia. I'll provide straightforward information about your rights and your school's obligations, information from other professionals on many topics, as well as tips and tricks for working with your school district. My goal is to empower you through your journey. But before we begin, here's my disclaimer. The information in this podcast is provided for general informational and entertainment purposes only and may not reflect the current law in your jurisdiction at the time you're listening. Nothing in this episode creates an attorney-client relationship, nor is it legal advice. Do not act or refrain from acting on the basis of any information included in or accessible through this episode without seeking appropriate legal or other professional advice on the particular facts and circumstances at issue from a lawyer or service provider licensed in your state, country, or other appropriate licensing jurisdiction. Okay, let's get started. Hi, and welcome. Thank you for joining me. Today, I have Andrew Feinstein and Marnie White, who are joining me to talk about some of the issues that families are having with the lack of distance learning that we are being offered for next year, which is a new situation that has now arisen. Thank you, COVID. First, we all had to be home. Now we all have to be out and some people can't be. So this has created a very large problem. And I have Andy Feinstein, who is a special education attorney in Connecticut, one of my esteemed colleagues, and Dr. Marnie White, who is not just a professor at Yale, but also a mom to a 10-year-old boy who needs to be in fifth grade next year and may not have that opportunity. So I'm not going to do all the introductions. Marnie, why don't you start by telling us about why Lane, your lovely son, can't go back to school in September? Thank you so much. Thanks for, for focusing on this issue. I really appreciate it. It's a big uh, the, issue right the short now. Of it is, thank you. Uh, the short of it is that, uh, ironically, uh, I find myself in this kind of cluster of a Venn diagram of circumstances where, as a professor of public health, I have been focusing a great deal on issues surrounding the pandemic. I'm very aware of the transmissibility of the various variants and so on. But the the overlapping irony is that I also am immunocompromised due to a a potentially fatal autoimmune disease with which I was diagnosed the month before the pandemic hit the United States. Um, I had initiated uh, treatment with a type of chemotherapy that wipes out my B cells, B cells being critical to developing antibody response to the COVID. COVID vaccine. So although I was vaccinated, um, I did not develop the antibodies. Luckily, I am the subject of much re- ongoing research <laughs> that is occurring uh, at, at Yale and other specialized treatment centers. Um, but because uh, my, my immune system has essentially been compromised by the life-saving treatment, I am extremely vulnerable to COVID were I to be exposed. So so help me understand this because what I'm hearing, and this is not my perspective, but I hear people say, well, then stay in a separate room, mask, keep a distance, you know, figure it out. People live with first responders. They're figuring it out. Why can't you guys figure it out? Well, I would I would actually say that we are figuring it out. Okay. Uh, we have remained in family level isolation for the entirety. Uh, we actually went in isolation before the lockdown in March 2020 because I was interacting with the data beginning in January 2020. I knew what was coming and realized probably actually a little bit late in the game for my own good, honestly, that we were being gaslit at a very high level and essentially made aggressive decisions before any kind of mandates came. In and, and pulled the family, pulled my child out of school. My husband had to stop working because he interacts with young children through his profession. And we went into family level isolation at that time. I remember when you did that and you made that choice. And I love that you said that we are figuring it out. <laughs> we have not been sitting around doing nothing for the last 18 months. We've been figuring it out. And it's just not that easy. I saw in one of the articles or interviews, I'm not sure that you've done, that you were saying that, you know, you offered to move out. You offered to move out and live elsewhere so that your son could go to school. And, you know, interestingly, your son and husband weren't on board with that. You know, I don't, you know, having mom move and live elsewhere. That didn't seem like the solution that they were looking for. And and taking on a a second rent, too, by the way, you know, taking on another expense, you know, and everything that goes with that. So it's not just like, hey, go move out. Where are you going to go? 
Right. Yeah. And that's, that's actually been a, that was one of our original approaches was, you know, I've seen these, these easy solutions presented of like, well, how about you just homeschool or how about you just get a different place to live? I don't think people understand that with this level of medical vulnerability, one cannot go house shopping or apartment shopping or to the grocery store. When there's a plumbing crisis in the home, we cannot have somebody who's potentially been exposed come into it. This is literally a sitting duck situation. And I I know this based on my privileged vantage point of being very familiar with the science that it is individuals who are on this kind of therapy who are not only most likely to die of the virus. We're looking currently, uh, initially it was more than 75%. Now treatment has gotten much better. um, And it looks like maybe only around 20% of the people who are on this therapy would ultimately die. But that's not really a roll of the dice that my family is willing to take. No. Sorry, I so, shouldn't be flip about it. I really shouldn't. I no, just no, no, sometimes I can't stop you know, myself. <laughs> you know me well enough. Uh, yeah. And most of all, my child is really inclined to play Russian roulette with my life. Uh, and that's these are the odds that we're looking yeah, at. Yeah. And what I find also fascinating is that Lane had such a great year last year that that the program that was put on was so good because we were searching for that in Connecticut where we reside. And, you know, very few school districts got that right. And right. and yours did. They really did. It was a really robust program. It was distinct from what was going on with the hybrid model, children kind of, you know, being zoomed into a classroom or whatnot. It was a robust, really appropriate model where there was a, you know, a classroom teacher meeting the kids on, you know, it's much the way we taught at Yale, actually, with uh, here, let's have some, here's some static lecture, here's some static material, here's some synchronous component, here's a teacher to help you and meet with you individually. It was terrific. It was, and he floor it. He did much better, actually, in this remote environment than he'd ever done. That's great. Um, in the typical classroom setting. Yeah. Well, and I think that's important because we've all been so focused on the kids that it's not working for that we forget that there is a way to do it successfully. There just isn't a way to set that up instantaneously when you had no idea that the entire world had to go remote. So it's not that this can't be done. It's just that last, you know, whenever it was that this happened, we didn't do it right. So I guess my next question then is, Andy, what do we do? Right. Lane doesn't have any special needs. I'm a special ed attorney. I've had a couple parents ask me this and I've said, I don't know, because I'm, I am dealing with it with some of my clients who have special education issues, which is allowing another angle to get in and to look at services for a child. But if your child doesn't isn't entitled to those services, Andy, what what do we do? What do these families do? Well, let me say first that districts are required to provide a re- remote instruction to students with disabilities if it's needed to provide a free and proper public education. That would be in the IEP, and without regard to any of these other circumstances, that remains a requirement. And so districts are uh, setting up programs for these kids, and of course, because it's uh, under the IDEA, because it's an IEP, uh, the first letter is individual. These are individualized programs. This is not one size fits all. So remote instruction does, in fact, exist. The question is for the narrower group of kids who are in immunocompromised families, whether a remote program of instruction uh, needs to be provided. Now, the issue about whether there's a legal protection where the disability is not the victim of the discrimination, but is a relative of the victim of the discrimination, I think is fairly clearly answered in the Justice Department guidance on the ADA. Um, And so I do think that there's uh, probably a, a valid cause of action here. We certainly hope never to get to that place. We certainly hope the districts recognize their obligation and and provide a program of remote instruction um, to, to folks in this in this category. Now, um, you know, one of the issues always has been, well, if we're going to establish some regulations on this issue, how do we distinguish between the valid cases and other people claiming that they want remote instruction? And I think there's a couple of reasons the State Department of Education has pushed all this out to local school districts. One of them is that reason that they'd rather have local school districts deal with uh, that issue. The second reason is, of course, that the State Department of Education historically, traditionally, and continually refuses to do anything mandated, to do anything clear for school districts. They want to provide guidance and not instruction. In this case, however, I, and I got to point this out, the guidance they provided has been incredibly confusing and ambiguous. And it's so confusing and ambiguous 
And I think it's being done by intent. I think they are trying to confuse this issue. It was a uh, phone call uh, uh, Monday um, between uh, the, the acting commissioner, Charlene uh, Russell Tucker, and the superintendents. I've talked to a number of superintendents since then, all of whom have a different answer as to what was said on this issue. So the State Department of Education is just not being clear about it. And their letter denying our complaint um, about this issue reflected that ambiguity. Um, they started talking about how their the school district cannot provide exclusively uh, remote uh, instruction, that that's not allowed. And that, of course, is not the question here. Well, why can't they? I guess I don't understand that. Why can they not? You said they can't do it. Why, why can't they do it? Well, I mean, I think the State Department could do it if they wanted to. It's just that historically they they don't right. issue regulations. They don't issue directives. No, I meant you when you said about the distance learning, they don't have to provide it. Like why or, or they can't provide it? Why can't they? Why is it difficult if extra kids want to be distanced? Well, the st- state statutes require in-person attendance now. This is an exception to what the statutes require, as was last year, you know, when it was done by executive order. Mm-hmm. So kids have to go. That's the law. They have to be in-person in school. So that is why we are mandating that students go back to school. That's right. But there is, there's plenty of legal authority for exceptions. To that. OK. And so we're looking for an exception. And right now, our state anyway, the state of Connecticut is saying, no, there's no exception, or at least not for you guys, right? Um, no, no. Okay, then tell me. On the hand, what am I getting there's wrong? No gen- there's no general exception, and kids have to come back to school, and you cannot establish a long-term program of remote instruction on the one hand, but they are saying, please do take steps to accommodate these kids. On the other hand, it's a complete mixed message. It is completely confusing, and it is leading, you know, Even well-intentioned superintendents, and Dana, you may not believe this, but there are well-intentioned superintendents out there to uh, not know what to do. So how do we guide them? How do we guide them? I think, you know, we we work with them. I mean, uh, Marnie has uh, called or reached out to her superintendent who uh, and hopefully they'll be able to work out something. If not, uh, there are, you know, of course, legal remedies, but legal remedies take time and cost money. And so it's not something that most people want to do. Right. And Marnie, it doesn't seem like this is a bone you plan to drop anytime soon. So that's just my impression. Am I wrong? I mean, I <laughs> that's that's kind of the thing, uh, you know, at a personal level. Could I drop it and move on? Sure. But, you know, I'm in public health. My my entire life career uh, emphasis has been trying to help others um, who are vulnerable. And so Mm -hmm. this is a conviction that I I feel very firmly. Um, And, you know, since I started talking about this publicly, by the way, I'm not particularly comfortable disclosing my medical vulnerabilities and making this this big public to do. I I can can vouch for that. I've known Um, Marnie for a number of years before she was (laughs) Dr. Marnie. And I can vouch for the fact that being on my podcast to talk about her medical status is not (laughs) where I ever thought you would be. So Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely not something I enjoy, but I also feel like it's the right thing to do because, and, and, you know, and, and I've gotten further validation on that because when I initially went on a brief news segment to discuss this issue back in February, I started getting flooded with notes from people from around the state in a similar situation with incredibly sad stories of, you know, going through cancer treatments, going through bone marrow transplants, going through organ transplants, having an incredibly ill family member and feeling as though the State Department of Education is literally Literally throwing, uh, you know, adding more insult to injury. People facing un- spousal unemployment or their personal unemployment, trying to navigate complex medical regimens, you know, facing mounting medical bills and having children who cannot go safely into the school building lest their very life be compromised and being denied right. any kind of educational option. And then being told loudly by local politicians and other people that they can just homeschool their children. And this is where, you know, I've really kind of started to flip out because, (laughs) you know, I'm not trained in elementary education at all. I think it would take an overwhelming amount of hubris to declare myself suddenly competent to be able to teach an elementary aged child. Unlike the armchair epidemiologists that have been mouthing off throughout this entire pandemic, I know the limitations of my education and training. 
I'm not an elementary school teacher. And if I were to be an elementary school teacher, then why the hell do we have to credential elementary school teachers if just anybody can do it? That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Well, and to add to that, I used to be uh, certified as an elementary education teacher and I have a master's in education and I was not prepared to even help my children with their education when the pandemic happened, more or less provided. And in fact, I have several children who are have a foot in the homeschooling world, and I've never taught them either. So that is not my skill set, and at least not at this point in time. So I also know that homeschooling isn't free. I think that's another piece that people don't realize. You don't just get online and find some worksheets. You know, homeschooling isn't free. Think about what happened last year when kids were sent home with packets and stuff like that, that it, it's not easy. It's not, right. and and again, not free. So Andy, what legal angles can we take now that you, you filed your complaint that was dismissed, but what are the other legal angles we can take? Because isn't this discriminatory for health reasons? I would argue it's a violation of ADA yeah. um, for a school district to deny educational opportunities to a student because of a disability in their family. Mm -hmm. I got to admit, I think that's a completely untested argument because usually the person claiming discrimination is the person who has the disability rather than one step removed in this case. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that the guidance from the uh, um, Justice Department on ADA really relatively covers this. Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly the guidance I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but the guidance on I like the retaliation weeds. retaliation talks about um, a relative of somebody with a disability who's discriminated against. The actual guidance on Title II does not, but I, by analogy, it seems to be the same sort of situation. So I think there's a credible uh, legal case to be made, but of course, you know, as you know as well as I do, that uh, federal litigation on ADA is many years in the in the processing. I mean, I, I, I guess I suppose one might make an argument to the Connecticut uh, Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, um, and they might show some interest, and they've shown renewed interest in issues of students with disabilities, and so that's a possibility. There's also, uh, uh, there are a variety of avenues uh, to take. But this issue isn't going to go away. And this issue is not going to go away. I mean, now that we have COVID and I, you know, somebody said to me the other day, they're like, well, it's just going to turn into like a flu shot. We're just ultimately going to be taking a shot every year. It's just going to be like the flu shot. If you don't take it, it's not a big deal, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's great. I hope we get there. We're not there yet. You know, we're just, we're nowhere near there. And just because that there are some things we can do to fend off the flu that also work with COVID doesn't mean it's the same thing. And Ezra Klein had a wonderful column in the Times on Sunday exactly on that issue about whether it whether it is becoming the flu um, and arguing about the, 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 the sharp differences. I'll tell you one of the things, one of the issues that has confronted us on this has been the whole uh, vaccine issue. Yeah. This, I'm not talking about the, the COVID vaccine. I'm talking about the, the anti-vaxxers who are a substantial proportion in the state. Um, and the, con- the concern expressed by some is, well, if we leave it open that, that families can claim to be immunocompromised, we're going to have the same situation that we had with the religious exemption um, to, to vaccines. Um, and, you know, again, that's one of the reasons why the State Department of Education kicked at the local school districts to make the determination. Um, in the case of, of Marnie White, we have, you know, there's just no question about what's, what's going on here. Although some are still questioning it, Andy. I mean, there was in a conversation with one of the State Department of Education attorneys, there was a question posed to me, well, so you're immunocompromised and that makes you susceptible to COVID, but wouldn't you have been susceptible to flu or any of the other seasonal problems? Like, why is it an issue with COVID? So people are still not able to understand that COVID is a very unique situation. And in fact, you know, even though I was on this immunosuppressing therapy prior to the onset of the pandemic, I did not have any concerns about teaching in public or allowing my child to go to school. And the reason I didn't have those concerns is because it is not the flu. (laughs) So the flu would not have killed me. Mm -hmm. I was able to have vaccines to the flu and to pneumonia prior to going on this um, immunosuppressing therapy. It's a very distinct hole in the immune system, which just happens to be the one most likely to be targeted by COVID. So it's a convergence of a very narrow type of immunosuppression, as well as an inability to mount the antibodies. So, you know, that's, those are naive, sorry, uninformed opinions. 
uh, people from outside of, you know, healthcare or epidemiology are posing and, and putting out there as though, you know, this is some level of fact when it's in fact, you know, <laughs> total ignorance. Well, let me, ask, let me ask Marty this question. Um, who define the universe of people who you think should be eligible for remote learning due to immunocompromising conditions, what, what those are? Um, well, it, so if we were making rules, if it's just people who've had chemo? Um, it depends on the type of chemo, but yes. And it also depends on the length of time. It depends on the status of, uh, you know, how built up their immune system is. So, um, and whether or not they're able to mount an antibody response. So that is something that is testable. So my suggestion would be, you know, individuals who are able to be vaccinated, who are able to not only take the vaccine, you know, there are some people for whom vaccines either would be contraindicated because of a medical vulnerability or um, would be perfectly fine to take, but they might not actually develop immunity or develop the antibodies. So I would say, you know, a really straightforward way to go about this would be, can the person be vaccinated? And if so, did they develop an antibody response? If they developed the antibody response, well, now there's no longer a need for elevated concern because that person would be much less likely to develop a severe case, be hospitalized or die. Well, how do you know you did not you, that you personally did not develop an immune uh, an antibody response. My physician ordered a test. So my physician uh, it was extremely concerned. And actually, there's an ongoing trial at Yale right now for individuals who have been on B-cell depleting therapies. So it's a swath of people, most of them with multiple sclerosis, um, others with a, a, a various types of neurological diseases who are taking these types of treatments. And the study is specifically designed around trying to identify whether or not uh, these patients can develop antibodies. So I was enrolled in that study, donated a lot of blood to the repository. I am literally a lab rat right now, <laughs> happy to do it. And uh, and hopefully the next wave of the study will be approved soon will there be, where they will be able to test the effectiveness of a wave of, of booster shots um, to see if kind of like tripling, quadrupling down or even crossing the, the different types of vaccines can can kind of force us into creating antibodies. Can I have, I have that a question for that? Not yet approved. Too. When you're asking yeah. about who should be eligible for it, and I, I just don't see why anyone shouldn't be, but... What about for people? I mean, if we're going to sit back and decide, well, we, we have to decide whether you are worthy of this distance learning because we have to make sure that someone in your family is actually immunocompromised and we're going to go do all this detective work because it's worth our yeah. time and energy um, to have one more person on the Zoom call. But <laughs> what about people who like, if you could die from getting COVID, if you could die from getting it and you get the vaccine and you develop the antibodies, that's not an easy adjustment for somebody to make and suddenly go, like, I have a severe allergy to fish and something in my test didn't show up. And my allergist said, you haven't eaten it in so long. So it didn't show up, but don't go eat sushi. Like, don't go out and have a meal of sushi because just because it didn't show up doesn't mean, and my point being, even if I'm told I can eat fish, I'm not going to go out and eat fish because for so many years, I've known that would kill me. So for somebody to ask them to suddenly wrap their brain around, now you can go out and just be in public. Is that asking too much or am I being too sensitive? Uh, Meaning that the stress, if you are sick, the stress that you take on makes you sicker, right? When you have a oh, yeah. serious sickness, right. now we're saying, yeah. okay, COVID could kill you. That's stressful. Oh, yeah. Now we're saying, okay, yeah. we don't think COVID will kill you anymore. So you have to go back out into the world now. And I'm just saying, you know, as we do with everything else, don't people need time to adjust their brains to that? Uh, I mean, I don't know that anybody is saying we don't think COVID is going to kill you anymore. What I hear them saying is we don't care if COVID kills you. Ah, uh, that would be a difference. Yeah. So, you know, while there have certainly been some local politicians and pundits who have declared that, you know, the appropriate thing to do is just to go out into public and let your family live their lives and risk death. My family disagrees. Uh, so that's that's kind of where we yeah, are. So nobody's denying that it's going to kill you. I mean, you're making no, a, no one's you're, denying. Everybody knows it will kill me. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's so this is a fact. Nobody's denying that. Nobody's denying that. OK, we've you're positing something else, Dana. You're saying, why shouldn't anybody be able to make the choice between remote instruction and in-person instruction for this coming school year? Well, no, that's my personal belief. What I'm trying to figure out is how do we make that rule? Right. Because if we're going to get schools to do that, they're going to want rules. 
So I'm trying to figure out, like, how do we make that black and white rule of who gets this distance learning or not? Like, I guess that's the part I'm under not understanding. If we have a program in place, we can put a program in place. Why are we concerned if an extra kid wants to do it? Like, why is that a problem? I feel like that's what I'm yeah, hearing. I keep sure. hearing, like, but everyone's going to want to do it. Well, if everybody wants to do it, maybe we should be doing it. Like, I don't understand the problem. Not to mention, it's so cost effective. Right? That's the part that's blowing my mind. So even looking at Fairfield, where there was a robust, very, you know, excellent remote learning academy, it only cost, you know, less than $5,000 per child or something like that versus the $22,000 per child or whatever it is hey. um, for in-person education. So I mean, if you think about the long-term implications of cost effectiveness, I mean, of course, it was a blindside expense that they had to right. create this additional right. thing. And so, you know, Not the really way it happened, the, but just in general. But, yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. But if you think about the potential for longevity of being able to educate children much more cost effectively, I don't understand where this myth of it being so incredibly expensive is coming from. And we know this at the, at the university level, it's a lot cheaper to educate people remotely um, if they have the stomach for it, if it works for them. Yeah, but I think that there's a very, and I think that it has been proven that there are very effective ways to teach online. I don't think Absolutely. many school districts implored those ways. I mean, I think that's, no. you know what I'm saying? So like, I think that, you know, everyone's saying that, oh, distance learning is bad. No, it's not. And it can be highly, no. highly effective and successful and kids can be social and they can make friends and they can do all these things. And they have been doing it forever. I've had kids do remote high schools, I mean, clients, and yep. it's absolutely doable. We didn't do it well. We didn't have the time. Right. We didn't know what we were doing. Right. We didn't invest the time right. and money into the structure. We didn't give, as Andy says, we didn't give good guidance. You know, we we're sort of like every man for himself. Good luck. It's not my fault. And, and that yep. was it. So I guess that is a problem, Andy. I do struggle when people are saying everyone's going to want to do it. Well, if everyone wants to do it, what's the problem? It's cheaper. And, and you know, and what we had and what, you know, the American Rescue Plan provided was the opportunity to reinvent education. Mm -hmm. This whole notion of in school, six hours a day, 180 days a year, you know, um, is the only way to educate a student. Um, is a very, you know, conservative uh, notion. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's probably you know, the way of the past. And we ought to be much, moving much more aggressively to other modalities of learning. And, you know, and the, the, the two modalities, um, uh, the three modalities that I've been touting are, one, you know, we really need a highly, uh, a high prestige vocational track in high school for kids, for all those, particularly young men, who have no interest in Shakespeare <laughs> or social sciences, who want to, you agree. know, who want to be plumbers and electricians. And we don't have them in society. I agree. We call a plumber or electrician now, and they're more likely my age than anybody else's. They're more likely in their 60s and 70s. Yeah. We need those people. That's one. Two, uh, you know, I think that uh, all kids ought to be outside at least an hour a day, regardless of the weather. As they say in Germany, you know, there's no such thing as bad weather. It's just bad clothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and you're going to learn a whole lot more about science walking through the woods than you are by sitting in a science class. That's two. And three, the great success that we found um, during the hybrid learning is small classes make a huge difference. No. And if we end up with a bunch of small classes, great. Um, well, that's just and it. we are I don't moving towards a, a new educational downside. model, and this is and this is the opportunity to do it. I know, and I don't see the downside. That's what I. That's what's making me crazy. I'm trying to understand what this downside is, what this barrier is, because you know it. it change, it, change is the barrier. So we're afraid institutionally of change. Yeah. Well, and non-disabled kids, I guess, aren't a protected class because I was going to say if we're providing yeah. this distance learning for kids with disabilities, but not for kids whose family has disabilities, it, it doesn't seem to make sense to me. I don't understand. I don't understand that 33 states have a public remote education option mm -hmm. for K through 12. Mm -hmm. 33 states. And, you know, Connecticut prides itself on being you know, progressive and informed and educated. And uh, it's really, I mean, it's embarrassing that Virginia, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm part of the job at Virginia, it's my hometown. I'm allowed to attack it. <laughs> or my home um, you know, that Virginia is more progressive than Connecticut. Give me a break. Yeah, that doesn't sit right. That doesn't yeah. sit right. And we also have this complete mythology that Connecticut is so far in ahead in terms of education. And you look at this, the scores on the assessment, and we actually did worse 
worse in fourth grade math than Texas did. Mm -hmm. No, we did. Yeah. And we keep saying that we're great. I I don't understand it. You know, I I don't. And you're right, Andy, we had a we have a chance. We still have a chance to redo things. And I'm worried because, and Marnie, to your point, you know, the reason that I think this is such an issue and we need to bring this to the forefront is it's not one that's going to go away. You know, we have a Delta variant out there. People are talking about, I'm really hopeful it's not going to happen and I don't think it is, but I hear people already talking about what if they shut down school again this year? You know, we are not guaranteed an in-person school year next year. And so, you know, and and the other piece of that, which drives me crazy, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I've had clients in the past, in the last 15 or so years, who have ended up with a remote option that was perfectly appropriate for them, but it wasn't like individualized by the school. Like they were using an online high school class to get their academics. And there were a variety of reasons as to why that worked. And the school accepted it. I had three different districts that had one that they accepted. They actually had a program. They said, if you do this one, we will accept it and give you a diploma. So I guess I'm just, I'm not understanding the barrier. I'm not getting what it is. And, and, and our whole world is changing. We keep talking about how we have to update our internet laws, right? Because we're so far behind. What about education? You know, the internet is here. A kid's entire world is going to be online. Yep. Well, I don't know if Andy would probably have the theory around that of like, why, why can't we get uh, up to speed here? And what is the the legal barrier? Why is the state department of education, um, you know, choosing to remain in the proverbial dark ages on this? And well, they, why they, they are. I mean, they uh, are. Uh, Senator McCrory, the, the, the Senate chairman of the education committee, has been pushing for a program of remote education. And that's what's in the legislation that's supposed to take effect in a year's time for high school uh, remote learning as the compromise. And the State Department was uh, quite resistant to, uh, to, the, to the process. I'm not sure the legislature is necessarily opposed to this, but somebody's got to do the work to create a model, to show the cost, to show the, the options available, to, to show that kids are going to get um, an appropriate education using a different model. You know, and there's also the the whole, you know, sort of administrator professional thing. This is the way we've done it. This is the way we'll always do it. Yeah, um, but that's yeah, always but been please a problem. Note that what, what Barney and I are talking about here is a very limited case of remote instruction. The broader case um, also has a lot to be said for it, but it's it's based on entirely uh, different arguments. So we have a problem. We're trying to address it. In the meantime, as we've already said many times, this is not going to be solved by September 1st. So for families like yours, Marnie, what are the options? Like what's what's your plan B? Uh, plan B is to tap into the college savings to pay for a private remote option. Um, you know, just it's the only option that you have. It. Yeah. Well, and, and it's a good thing that you uh, have that savings because yeah, for families yeah. who don't, that's not an option. No, they'll have to take out loans or, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just, and, and, and again, it's like the, the, the level of stress that's compounding, especially when you're talking about pandemic related unemployment. Mm-hmm. Um, Your husband had to shut down his goals. practice. Yep. You know, and yep. I know that there are some so, things that he can still do online, but it's not anywhere near the practice oh. that he had before. It's not even a fraction not even, of it. Even one tenth, not even, no. Right, exactly. Not even one tenth the level of income. So that's not, you know, an option. And we are very lucky that we've been able to get by and, and keep us all safe. Yeah. But uh, I know many people are not in that position. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time exploring plan B's now um, because we're still hoping that, okay. that we can work out something with uh, Mike Cummins, the superintendent in, in Fairfield. So what's your hope then? What's your hope for how to this will turn provide instruction. Out? But, you know... If that's not possible in Fairfield or elsewhere, it seems to me the unilateral placement option under IDEA provides a model for how we do this, which is we basically say we're providing this private instruction. Here's the bill. Pay it. And, uh, you know, they the districts will uh, will resist. But a, a, a couple of ADA based lawsuits may get them to rethink that. Yeah. You know, we hope we don't have to go that road. Well, I do, too. But if you guys solve this issue, someone somewhere else may have the same issue and they need a roadmap for solving that, too. So I, that's, that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, I think that, you know, steps one, two and three is to work with your local school board. Yeah. And step four is to call a lawyer and litigate. I mean, I, you know, what? I think there is valid litigation here. I think you're right. And I, but, I, you know, it's it's just it is just a shame. It is just a shame that the State Department of Education, you know, stuck its head in the stand, sand worse than that did it in a way that was just dishonest and illogical and not based on science. 
it is just really discouraging to see a state agency that I actually work with very closely um, act so irresponsibly. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. And I think it's unfortunate. We have a possible solution and no one's willing to take the time to figure it out. So I'm hopeful. No one's willing to push the button to figure it out. It's not even taking the time. Right. They're not even there yet. (laughs) They haven't even gotten to that. They won't even entertain the idea. Yeah. So you can't get very far if you want to entertain the idea. Well, I do hope that your situation progresses well and that you are able to get instruction for Lane. But more so than that, I am hopeful that this will help educate people and get the word out there and let people know who are by themselves and think they're the only ones in the world going through this. You are not. I love, Andy, what you said about using the unilateral placement as a model. And I think that is a great way to go. So I, I'm not going to explain that right now. I'm not, I'm not giving anyone legal advice. But if you are in this situation where your child cannot go to school because somebody in your house is compromised, definitely consult with an attorney. Maybe start with a special education attorney because they will know what the rules are about school. And that's a good place to start. Um, and that model is a good one to follow. Are there any other um, recommendations that you guys would make for parents out there who are in this situation right now? You know, our main strategy has been public pressure here. Public pressure. And that's what we'll continue to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's up to local school boards. And, you know, I think Marnie is absolutely right that that local school boards have got to understand that this is actually a cheaper option for them, not a more expensive option. I haven't always found that argument to work. And, of course, the really, really inexpensive option, the really inexpensive option would be for the state to provide a program of remote instruction at various grade levels for all districts that all districts could access. And, you know, because this is general education, it's not special education, it's not individualized. And so the state could provide a program of remote instruction, either directly or by contract, and, you know, eliminate this problem. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really see the. Yeah, I guess I, I don't see the problem in ha- offering it for anybody. Make your choice. Do you want to be in person or do you want to be at, at home? And, and making parents pay for homeschooling seems just ridiculous to me. As far as the academics go, I get all the other stuff. But like, I, I just don't understand why. I don't. I don't understand a lot. I don't know. Well, and, and the state <laughs> department of education continually complains about homeschooling, saying that they have no control over the content. Here's an opportunity where they can actually have some control over the content mm-hmm. and provide the option that so many parents want. Mm-hmm. I know that that so many people had suggested making Fairfield the example, or, or you know, like creating a robust, keeping the remote learning academy open, and then allowing other districts to pay into it. You know, essentially being at the forefront of this, considering they did it so successfully. They won't release the data. I don't have official data. All I know is that every single person I know who was involved in the Remote Learning Academy had experienced an, uh, really good outcomes. Um, so I believe the data are available. We have test scores available. They won't release them. I Can think you it is FOIA no them? Order. Can you, is there Maybe, yeah, I don't freedom know, of information? But, you know, perhaps. Yeah, I would like to I see I don't that. know how that's well, I, yeah, yeah, but, I mean, uh, yeah, but they have, yeah, there was a real opportunity. And instead of, you know, actually promoting the Remote Learning Academy and making it available to other districts, they chose instead to vilify it and to create this narrative where supposedly the existence of the RLA is what uh, prevented other kids to from going back to school full time. I mean, forget the backdrop of the pandemic and people getting sick. Apparently, it was just this remote learning, according to the local. Right, population. right. And some well, that probably makes well. total sense because it's the same way that special education takes all the money away from other students all the time, like all of it. Right. They don't they don't have any other money left over. So, you know, I get that. Again, that's me being sarcastic for anyone who doesn't yeah. know me well. Yeah. But. Ironically enough, the same board of ed members who vilified the uh, the remote options are the ones who are loudest about getting special education services. So that was an ironic little. Oh, that's twist. interesting. So guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's also, I mean, the Fairfield board also, you know, embarrassed it, soiled itself in public by sending a letter to the state um, yeah. against masks. Yeah. Um, what was that about? Oh, Oh, no, it's still going on. Um, I actually, along with some other faculty at Yale, Sacred Heart and Mount Sinai Schools of Public Health, sent a, a letter recently to the Board of Health, uh, to the, sorry, the Board of Education, uh, outlining all of the critical reasons that masks in school remain necessary and actually received some pushback from members of the Board of Education challenging the points um, from a completely uninformed perspective. I mean, we're talking about a battery of five MDs and PhDs who specialize in these topics and someone with no experience whatsoever in health, epidemiology, infectious disease at all saying, you know what, I think you're wrong on that point. 
you know, because I saw some blog somewhere or something on social media. So I don't really believe what you're saying. Right. It's Again, cold. So there's no global hubris. warming. I'm cold. So there's no global warming. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So the hubris with which individuals who are clearly this is not in their domain to to push back against, you know, just, they're completely again, unqualified. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've read that about myself. I'm I'm unqualified to teach about the pandemic. I literally teach. That's epidemiology what you do. You have a degree in it. Right. I have a degree. Don't I, degree la- I think I think Yale pays you to talk about it. Right. They do. They do. Yeah. They give you yeah. money. I do. And then you talk yeah, to sometimes. students. I love uh-huh. that. I yeah. love that. That that yeah. that sounds to yeah. me like someone who knows what they're talking about. I'm just going to throw Maybe. it out there. Yeah. Well, I do hope that this comes to uh, a positive ending for you guys. And I also hope that it starts a bit of a movement everywhere else, because I don't see this going in a different direction. I mean, we've heard a number of times over the pandemic, this isn't the last pandemic we're going to have. It's, you know, we need to keep an eye on this and we need to be cautious and we need to be doing this smart. And hopefully this will give people some motivation to raise their voices and help encourage schools to do the right thing. And for people who are listening who say, well, I clearly need to call Andy Feinstein right now because he needs to hear my story. Andy, how can they reach you? I love the silence. Not, not at all. Them. Not at all. <laughs> um, email is a Feinstein, F-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N at edlawct.com. Excellent. And that will be in my show notes. I'm going to have all their contact information in my show notes. So if you're listening to and this. You've, you've got it. You can put it. You can put it all down there. But there are also a number of other highly qualified special education attorneys in the state. Um, one that comes to mind is a woman named Dana Johnson. I haven't heard of her. Is she any good? And uh, what is she? Does she know anything? I don't know. A little sarcastic at times. <laughs> at times. But, um, just every now and again. Not all the time. Just sometimes. <laughs> and Dr. Marnie White, for people who say you are speaking their truth and they want to join your movement, how are they going to find you? Oh, well, we have a Facebook group, Connecticut Families in Need of Remote Education. That would be the best way to, to try to get together. I love um, with that. Other people we also have a petition uh, on change.org if you search Marnie White. Well, I will uh, put the link to come. all that in the show notes. Oh, that's awesome. I will make Thank that you. simple for everybody. So, yeah. So the Facebook page is Connecticut Families in Need of what? Remote education. Remote education. I'll send you the link. Okay, send me the link. And I will send all that stuff in the show notes so that you can reach Andy or Marnie if you need to. In the meantime, please raise your voices for the other families who need this remote instruction. Encourage your school boards to consider it and encourage your State Department of Education to consider it. Thank you. And thank you guys for joining me. Thank Thank you. you for having us. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please don't forget to follow this podcast so you don't miss any new episodes and leave a review when you have a chance. If there's anything you want to hear about or comment on, please go to my Facebook page, Special Ed on Special Ed, and find me there. I'll see you next time here on Special Ed on Special Ed. Have a fabulous day. The views expressed in this episode are those of the speakers at the time of the recording and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company, or even that individual today. 